Um, I'm Kieran, and I'm one of the Wellington Socialist Society members. Welcome to our evening on social democracy. Um, we're very fortunate to have three really interesting speakers with us tonight. Uh, we've got Tamitha Paul, who I'm sure you all know, a local body politician and running for Wellington Central for the Greens. Uh, we've got Tom Rout here from the Canterbury Socialist Society, which is um, part of our National Federation of Socialist Societies, which Wellington is a member of. And we've got Jim McLoon, who's a professor of history at Victoria University. So, yeah, um, we're a pretty broad tent organisation, and I suppose this event kind of reflects one, uh, maybe the more moderate uh, wing of the organisation. Social democracy, about democracy, I suppose, is a fairly old term, um, but um, arguably it's a politics which is still alive today. Um, and we have young politicians um, such as Tamitha, arguably keeping that politics alive. So, um, Jim's going to give us obviously a bit of the historical context. He's the historian present, um, but we've got a couple of people here who are going to be speaking on where that politics is um, today in the 21st century. Um, so yeah, it's basically the format is a 10-minute uh, contribution from each of our guests, um, and then I'll uh, ask one or all of them a question, um, and then we'll open uh, the floor to questions from any of our uh, attendees today. Um, so yeah, um, we're going to try and work to a fairly uh, a shorter time, short, we're going to work to a bit of a shorter time frame than we have in the past, um, just to accommodate everyone's schedules. Um, so we'll have a five minute break between the, um, the comments from our guests and, and the questions and we, um, uh, we won't have too many questions tonight. Um, just some kind of housekeeping stuff. Um, we have a sign-up sheet uh, being pointed out by Angus, who's currently the chair of the Wellington Social Society. So if you haven't joined and you're interested in joining, sign-up sheets uh, found over there. Uh, if you want more information about our uh, organisation or the national organisation, there's a website and there's also Facebook, uh, Twitter, that sort of thing. So we have our events posted there. Um, for your information. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I've really got to say. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Tamitha. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting my order completely wrong. We're, we're starting with Jim, rather. He's the, he's the historian. So he's going to um, give us a little bit of historical context to what uh, social democracy has meant in the past in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, Tino Tato, thanks for, for coming everyone and uh, thanks Kieran for that, that introduction and welcome. Um, yeah, I could start by defining social democracy but I think that becomes evident as, as, as we work it out in practice. So uh, by the end of what I have to say, I think perhaps there will be a, a few ideas of what I, what I mean by it. First World War was critical um, in bringing together, especially in this country, uh, the militant socialist wing of the Labour movement, the Red Feds and their um, comrades on the one hand, and folk who I guess might have been radical liberals uh, if the Liberal Party had remained radical, um, as it had not been by about 1910. And what brought them together, of course, uh, fundamentally, was the issue of conscription for military service in 1916. Uh, the party, the Labour Party, was founded just a block or two away from here. Uh, but it is part of an international tendency in left politics. And I think uh, perhaps a few key themes at the start. One, and you know, this is all part of the crisis of the First World War uh, in the aftermath. The Bolshevik road is not preferred, even if they weren't explicitly quoting that lovely tagline from Rosa Luxemburg that was in, in the um, publicity for, for tonight. And on the other hand, democratic forms of organisation were to be preferred. Uh, and in fact championed. Now, some of the European social democratic parties had been heavily involved in the struggle for liberal democracy. Not so evidently here. Uh, you might think that that was done and dusted by 1893. Not quite, never is. But um, still, working class mobilisations had been significant in the struggles for political democracy here as well. Um, a key point, I think, as this uh, left politics, this form of politics evolved both here and elsewhere, is that the classic male manual working class 
was not a majority of the population. Uh, therefore, the analysis was that that was an insufficient political base, and even if it were a majority of the population, it wasn't a monolith. I mean, there's always uh, working class voters who vote elsewhere, uh, to put it politely. So the uh, strategy generally is to broaden the base, to bring in middle class progressives, to detach them from liberal parties, and that's a long run thing here in Australia, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, and especially to pitch to women to espouse a politics of inclusion. Uh, by the late 1920s, the classic statement by the Swedish Social Democratic Party was to talk of the people's home, that in the good, good home, the good family, there's cooperation, there's equality, everyone contributes what they can and receives what they need. And, and so that very homely analogy was perhaps designed to make the politics look a little less, less threatening, but it also was to talk a language of solidarity, I think, and of, of mutual consideration. Well, that was all fine as far as it goes, but the approach to questions of political economy was critical. And that is where um, some parties did better than others. And among them that did do better earlier was the New Zealand Labour Party. And I guess the technical term for the sorts of economic analyses that developed during the difficult years of the 1920s here and elsewhere was under consumptionist economics. Fundamentally, that's the idea that recessions and depressions are a consequence of inadequate demand. Working people don't have enough money to spend on the basics and the um, comforts of life, therefore demand suffers, therefore production uh, declines, therefore unemployment increases. And if the orthodox approach to a recession is to cut public spending, as it was, then you just intensify the problem and you get into a death spiral. And this is very much a challenge to the orthodoxies of 19th century uh, classical economics, as it is a challenge to neoliberal orthodoxies today. Um, and there was a lot of economic thinking around this in the 1920s and early 30s. Most famously, John Maynard Keynes, that great English bourgeois liberal, high-minded fellow that he was, but also his slightly older contemporary, John Hobson, who wrote a lot on imperialism as well, and also a bunch of younger economists in Stockholm, in, in Sweden. And there was a whole intellectual community spanning the North Sea, I think, um, Hobson perhaps focused on uh, keeping working class wages at a um, reasonable level as the solution to crises of um, low demand. Keynes talked about investment and with colleagues developed the idea of the multiplier, that for every pound you spend on investment in public works uh, or public projects, you actually create um, one plus X in terms of new income, new jobs, new demand. So that approach to economic management, to political economy, is called counter-cyclical. Uh, when times are, are tough, when there's a recession, public authorities are spend to increase, to maintain demand, and to keep employment high, to kick off the virtuous circle. But I really do want to stress too that um, the counter-cyclical bit went the other way as well. In times of inflation, in times of overheated demand, uh, fiscal uh, policy would be used to damp it down a bit. Uh, and I think that's really important because it's a neoliberal fallacy that Keynesian economists don't care about inflation. They always did. Okay, so as the program developed, both here and uh, in some overseas parts, key principles, public works at normal wages, economic modernisation, and that's really important. There is a nation-building plan in there. Uh, Welfare payments, transfer payments, redistribution through tax taxation systems um, to favour those groups which need support, typically families, um, classically in New Zealand also, non-earning uh, mothers with children via the family benefit, that sort of thing. A degree of integration of trade unions into the political structure, um, whether formally or informally. Uh, government taking responsibility for monetary policy not some contract contracting it out to an independent so-called reserve bank. High and stable spending power and demand on the part of the population to maintain that virtuous circle. 
So those are the key elements, and, and I guess that's a pretty good summary, I hope, of 1935, of the approach that the New Zealand Labour Party had as they went into the election that year. Now, I do want to yeah, emphasise that the crisis of the Great Depression was hugely important. Um, it gave space for experimentation, at least in some places, certainly here, I think also in Sweden. What's also important is that the New Zealand Labour Party's parliamentarians were reading and discussing all this stuff in the 1920s and early 30s. And I think that's quite remarkable, because uh, with very few exceptions, these Labour politicians don't have much formal education. A uh, few of them have been through high school. They are self-taught. They get their economics and their politics through the WEA, the Workers' Educational Association, through their own reading and their own learning. And you can actually trace their thinking through their speeches through the 20s. Um, so but the key point about the New Zealand Labour Party is that it had a coherent plan of this sort going into the 1935 election. And I want to make that point again because it seems to be the one criterion for social democratic success is having a plan. The British Labour Party in 1929, the Australian Labour Party in 1929, full of good intentions, no plan. Uh, the result was incoherence, um, drift, and in the end, devastating splits, which, which reinforced the Conservatives. Okay, but I also want to make the point that in New Zealand 1935, although it was a, a big landslide for the Labour Party in terms of parliamentary seats, it wasn't in fact a huge voters' mandate. It was only 47% of the vote. And I think that's another point I want to make. Um, the New Zealand Labour Party, like the Swedish Party, seized the opportunity. And I think there's a theme then of moving with some decisiveness once you have the chance. And uh, it paid off in 1938 uh, with a sustained majority in Parliament, uh, about 56% of the vote, 56% of the electorate supported Labour in 1938. Um, I think that's a record for a social democratic party anywhere. Um, I do want to um, emphasise too, it was about modernisation, it was about a degree of economic nationalism, it was explicitly looking beyond New Zealand as Great Britain's farm, um, and while it's easy to sort of contrast the practical, apparent moderation of this approach to the um, staunch rhetoric of 1916, uh, and Keith Sinclair's got a lovely phrase about Walter Bash's cornucopia of pink candy floss, that's to underestimate how radical it was in the context of the orthodoxies of the day. Okay, well, flaws, problems. Perhaps thinking that economics had become a simple technical matter, depoliticised, so that after 1945 it was easy for Tories to pick up a sort of a commitment to, to some sort of welfare state, realising that this was the way the tide was going. Fundamental questions, what next? What do you do after the welfare state? And that requires some creative thinking, which arguably uh, is very difficult. Another mistake, uh, and this is really evident in one of the great British post-war social democratic thinkers, Tony Crossland, assuming that the Tory acceptance of the welfare state was permanent. It wasn't. Um, and that means that yeah, there was a, a sustained intellectual counter-revolution throughout what's like the Montpellier society, uh, which ushered in neoliberal thinking later on. Third and last, were social democratic parties sufficiently receptive to the new social movements of the 1960s, to women's mobilisations, to indigenous and minority mobilisations, to environmental politics and so forth, and I'll just leave that question there. Um, fundamentally, I think neoliberalism uh, took its chance in the 1970s to massively undermine social democracy, but we're still left with the question which I, I think the panel tonight or the discussion tonight might explore. Was it a form of politics for the time or does it still have some uses? So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, I um, realise I slightly brushed over my introductions. I've made these careful notes, and I should have mentioned that you're the author of a couple of books, which, um, if you're interested in what Jim had to say, 
you might want to explore, uh, namely the uh, History of the Labour Party, which was published in 2016, with um, co-authored with Peter Franks, uh, and another book, uh, Judgments of All Kinds, Economic Policy Making New Zealand from 1945 to 1984. So obviously this is an area of speciality uh, for Jim. Okay, so uh, we will get to some questions um, soon, but um, I'm going to pass straight over to Tamitha, who's going to talk about her experiences uh, as a young politician uh, with Wellington uh, City Council. Thanks, Kieran. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you, Jim, for that. Um, that was really cool and really interesting. Um, yeah, so kia ora koutou. I'm Tam with Paul, or Tam. Um, a little bit about me. Um, so I was uh, born in South Auckland. My whanau largely um, grew up in Auckland actually. Um, my nana actually grew up in Ponsonby, which is like really buzzy to think about now. Because yeah, it's just buzzy to think about. Um, we moved around a little bit after I was born and um, ended up landing in a place called Tokoro in the South Waikato. Um, and that's where I grew up. And um, that upbringing in Tokoro has like totally informed the way that I see the world and the way that I participate in politics and um, if you don't know about it, it's um, it's a timber mill town so um, there's the Kinleith Mill out there and um, that's kind of um, the heartbeat of the town um, and everyone is somehow connected to, to the mill in some way, most people's whānau work there and um, we had um, a really massive um, migration of people from the Cook Islands who came over to Tokoroa. That's why Tokoroa is also called the 16th island of the Cook Islands, because there's more Cook Islanders in Tokoroa than in the Cook Islands. Um, but, yeah, so a lot of people came over from the Cook Islands to work in that mill, and um, so we, we had this whole like ecosystem around, around the mill. My dad was a truck driver getting those, um, some of those logs um, to the mill. My mum is an uh, aged care worker, so she looks after um, old and disabled people. Um, and she's done that my whole life, and she still does that now. Dad's still a truck driver. Um, and yeah, I think growing up there, I, I, it really just informed, I guess, a, um, a, a real kind of working class spirit within me. I was the first person in my family to go to university, so. I guess I just got real fucked off living in Tope because you had like the shitty council who, you know, all the councillors lived in Patararu, which is not Tokoroa. They lived in Tito and Patararu. They're like these rich farmers who like, you know, didn't give a shit about what happened in Tope, despite the fact that it's like one of the biggest towns in Aotearoa. Um, and you had, um, you had this national MP who, you know, somehow we're in the Tope War electorate, um, who only cared about Tope War. And so we were kind of just stuck in the middle and it was a really rough, place to grow up. If you've been to Tokoroa, I mean, you probably haven't, no offence, but you probably haven't. Um, it's, um, it's got real challenges. Um, it's like, poverty is like right in your face and, and what goes wrong when you don't give people enough to live on, you don't give people enough to put food on the table, wages are so low that people can work 50, 60 hours and still not have enough to pay their bills and, and put food on the table and provide. You know, I grew up seeing the impacts of that at like a really like accelerated level. In saying that though, it was a really beautiful place to grow up at the same time because we had a really strong like cultural community and we really tried to come together to provide things that we weren't getting anywhere else. Um, I'm, I'm 26 now, so growing up there was like John Key era, so like you can kind of imagine what that looked like. But it did give me hope that we would, you know, we did band together and try to provide things for each other um, where possible as a community, and so I think that's really shaped my um, views and ideas around kind of collectivism, grassroots movements, and being able to provide those things for ourselves where the state isn't going to step in and help us. It's really ironic though because when John Key came to Tope, everyone loved him. So it was just like, yeah, anyway. So um, so that's where my like politics come comes from. And um, and yeah, I, I guess I'd describe myself as an as an urban Māori too. Tope's quite an urban um, as, as an 
Yeah, it's pretty urban. It's not really that rural. You might think it's rural because it's in the provinces, but it's quite urban. And um, so I've always been really interested in like the research by Jane Kelsey and the way that she looks at the urban drift for Māori and how you know different policies pushed us towards these um, big towns and big cities. And um, and it's always been really interesting to me how um, you know. Cities were shitholes, you know, for a lot for, during that time. We had urban slums, um, particularly here in Wellington, and lots of Māori came to these cities and to these big towns to to work and to provide for their fano. And all these policies pushed us towards here, and now we can't fucking afford to live here because it's all been totally gentrified. And so that's kind of maybe my major issue that I've been trying to work out um, through council and and even before that is how can we like stay here and how do we carve out a space for us to live here because this is where all the opportunities are this is where the education is this is where all the jobs are this is where the studios are like this is where lots of people want to be but unfortunately Wellington has become totally out of reach for most people and that's why we're 120 bus drivers short and our buses never come because bus drivers can't afford to live here. So we have to bring 120 bus drivers over from the Philippines who, who we're going to give them low wages. We're not going to support them to, um, to be, you know, to, to give them homes, to give them the resources that we need, uh, that they need. That's the reason why some of our services at the hospital get cut because the people who run those services on the front lines also can't afford to live here. Um, sometimes your rubbish might not get picked up off the side of the road for a, for a couple of weeks because even waste tr our waste truck drivers can't afford to live here. So I guess my big thing is trying to get people to see that um, our city's going in a direction, and if it keeps going in that direction, it's going to be a really shitty place to live because we're not going to have anything. No workers are going to be able to live here, and, and trying to bridge that gap for people in, in people's minds, I think is kind of the most important thing, um, the most important challenge facing our city. Um, so, I guess um, me politically, um, I don't really know what the labels are. To be honest, I had to ask what social democracy meant. That's really shocking. Um, I've got a master's in planning that, <laughs> but. Um, I don't I mean it's just like I just go with what feels right in my heart and what feels right in my guts and um, and I often reflect on my upbringing and um, and that kind of guides the politics that I try to do but I guess I'm most interested in doing things that affects everybody I guess that's like universal things I'm, I'm really interested in having a really broad offering of public housing for people I hate that we've got such a residualized model of public housing in New Zealand that it's only for the most needy which I think is important but I think that everybody that wants it should be able to get it, and so we need to build so much more public housing. So a big focus for me on council has been um, trying to build more council housing and um, working with tenants, the people living in that housing, to try and advocate for their rights um, and their right to um, you know, an income-related rent subsidy, which you know, councils, council tenants are the only tenants in public housing in New Zealand that don't get access to that subsidy and that's a conscious decision that the Labour government continues to make every single year. Um, and and that's, that's something that's really pissed me off about this Labour government is that they like they're just doing everything that's anti what they said they were going to do. Like we have had to put our housing into a community housing provider because they won't give us the, the income related rent subsidy. And we were the third biggest landlord in New Zealand and we held on to that housing because it was in the council, because it wasn't a part of climate order, because we were able to protect it against the changing governments and now we've had to give that up because even though they said in 2017 that they would give us the income related rent subsidy, they went back on their promise so that sucks. But also this um, situation last week with um, the airport share sales in um, in Auckland, you had Labour and Green City Vision councillors selling public assets um, for the airport when the government could have stepped in to, to assist. And it's just, it's really disappointing to see um, the way that um, councils are going back. Because as shit as councils are, and as much as they are engaged with by the same groups of people, they really had some good things going on. And I think that council housing is a real big part of that. And some of those services that they've maintained in-house is a really important part of realising, I guess, a social democracy in New, uh, in New Zealand in 2023. Um, 
but it just sucks because you just it's just in such a state in terms of who stands for councils around the country and who's represented on those councils. Which leads me to a conversation I was having with my colleagues yesterday. Because we were having a chat, and I probably shouldn't say this, but we were having a talk. <laughs> and and um, and some of the councillors of, of the more conservative persuasion were saying, I really, and shout out to uh, my councillor colleague Nico, we met us here as well. Um, and they were saying, you know, like, I, I just I just hate it how you guys are so ideological. You're just so ideological and we can't get anything done because you guys just won't listen because, and it always goes back to this ideology. And I said to them, you guys don't even realise, like, you're so brainwashed that you think that you're not ideological. Like, you think, you think that giving low rates at any cost and neglecting the pipes, neglecting the transport infrastructure and neglecting everything, you don't think that's ideological and that's the insidious thing about you is that you can't even see what you believe. You, 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 think, you think you've got no ideology. Anyway, I loved saying that. I love being a council sometimes. Really sorry, this has been a bit really disorganised on my part. Um, but I guess just what I'll quickly say is that I think that it's a really fucking mean time to live in Wellington. Um, I think, oh well, it's also really bad. But, 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 but compared to other cities, I think we are doing really well. I think the housing conversation that we've been able to have in the last few years has been really transformational. The heritage lobby in, in Wellington has never been challenged and we've really done that and we've tripled the housing capacity for Wellington City and I think that's really, really exciting. Um, we're building affordable housing in the city. Um, that's been a buzzy experience working with developers to be able to, um, to, to deliver that. and. Um, yeah, I, but I think we're generally moving in a, in a good direction. There's like hundreds of public housing about to be built. We went on a tour last week um, on Tuesday. We checked out Arlington, which is going to be 350 new public houses. We checked out Rolleston Street in Mount Cook, which is going to be 80 new public houses, including 20 of those which are going to be single site supported, which is just like 24-7 like on-site support for um, high needs people who need that wraparound support. Um, there's like public housing being built everywhere. It's honestly amazing. Um, transport, like I know everyone rolls their eyes at Let's Get Wally Moving, but it will be really good and we really need it, need to, it to happen a lot sooner. Um, but that will really transform the way that we move around the city and the way that we get about. Um, and also like, um, something that we don't really talk about heaps is like our city safety and, and trying to tackle the issue of like people that feel unsafe in the city and trying to find alternatives that isn't just like trying to put more resourcing into the police like we're trying to tackle it through like urban design we're trying to do it through um, working with um, people who are in the city trying to put more activations on the street to get more people on the street at all hours of the night um, we're really trying to like take a kind of alternative approach to what we know to be policing in the community so I haven't really talked at all about the campaign but it's been a really good campaign for Wellington Centre, it's a real grassroots campaign and I think we're going to win a hope and um, and, um, and yeah I guess the last thing I'll just say is it's really cool to be here and it's really awesome to see a thriving community of people who are like talking about these kinds of things because I think it's really important we had a um, urban Māori who at Wānanga at um, VGI yesterday and it was kind of the same vibe just Discussing these ideas and building that movement, and moving, building that movement, and that's why I joined the Greens. It wasn't because like I agree with everything they do, and in fact, I get really frustrated sometimes by what they do. But it's because I guess I recognise that if you want to get anything done, you do need that mass. And I'd much rather be part of a movement, putting my head down and doing the hard work, as opposed to um, just being like a soul kind of person, trying like a kind of martyr for for things that I believe in, but not really achieving anything. So. But then I guess that's probably what Labour MPs say too. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I'll leave it at that. And um, yeah, Kara. Thanks very much, Kenneth. It was really interesting and in seeing your story and how that's led to you developing a, a practical politics. Um, I also liked your comment about um, 
not being particularly caught up in labels, because that's a bit of a lesson to us more on the sort of boffin end of the spectrum, you know. <laughs> learn our politics from books, but actually people who go out and really do it and make a difference often, you know, learn it through experience and stuff, so, so thanks a lot. Okay, so um, our last speaker is uh, Tom Rowd. So as I said earlier, he's the chair, uh, no, not chair, <laughs> sorry, he's executive member of the Canterbury Socialist Society, and I, and I think you're just going to talk to him about what this organisation maybe can add to uh, to left-wing politics in New Zealand at present. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, Karen, and uh, thank you so much to the other panellists. That was awesome. Uh, it feels really, uh, really nice to be up here in Wellington, coming for a little visit, and being on a panel with um, people who both have the uh, extraordinary practical experience of actually running for these um, bodies, which sometimes, you know, as I'm sure you can say, are, are frustrating to work for, a difficult, uh, not exactly set up for making the sort of changes that we, a lot of us would like, and also the, the depth of knowledge and experience and um, the historical sort of like context that you can bring, Jim, is awesome, and I thought it was a really nice opportunity to get to sort of, just to add a bit of something else on the end, um, and I feel really, really uh, privileged to do that. So uh, thank you both so much for that, and um, thank you for the Wellington Socialist Society for having me on. Um, so what I want to talk about is sort of, uh, I've, I've, I've titled what I want to talk about, like the idea of the room for social democracy today. And um, I guess part of part of what I want to talk about is like, why would a socialist, you know, we, we call ourselves the socialist society, why would, why would a socialist, self-described socialists talk about social democracy as something other than a, you know, a slur, like a lot of the time it's, it's used as a pejorative term because in the history of our movement it does tend to be on the more, as Jim sort of alluded to, conservative end of the politics of the labour movement, like it's, it is more conciliatory, it is more compromising, etc, etc. And nonetheless I think there's a huge amount that's really interesting to talk about social democracy. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, when I think of social democracy, I actually begin with the original Clause 4 of the UK Labour Party, which some of you might actually be quite familiar with, but nonetheless, I'll read it aloud, Jim's laughing, um, uh, which is, uh, yeah, the purpose of the party is, okay, uh, to secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange, and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or service. Um, so adopted in 1918, this certainly doesn't represent actually the height of our social democratic policy and influence. That would come a bit later, as sort of Jim talked about, when they actually sort of started making gains and started making changes to the way that a lot of societies were organised. Um, but what it does represent, I think, is a culmination of um, some decades, or arguably actually a century, of activity and movement in Britain and in Europe generally, um, finding a way to articulate itself and what it's about. So, um, not only that, but rather than a set of policies to be implemented, or a program, or a political program to vote for, it presents social democratic politics as a process or something that um, must be strived towards rather than declared from a parliamentary pulpit. Um, it may not be revolutionary socialism, as um, some people in the room probably are hoping for, um, but it also avoids the trap often associated with social democracy, which could be called um, resolutionary socialism, <laughs> where <laughs> declaring socialism by dip tap. Um, <clears throat> But nonetheless, why, why would self-described socialists be particularly interested in any of this? Um, in the simplest terms, I think it is because uh, we may well make history, as people are quite familiar with the phrase I'm butchering, I'm sure, um, but not in conditions of our own choosing. Um, there is no reason really to believe right now that a more expansive or radical program than social democracy is on the immediate horizon in this country. Um, if we are required to be, as some of the quotes about uh, that the lunch socialists put out about this talk said, as radical as reality itself, um, it seems that reality has not really kept up with the most extreme desires of the far left. And I consider myself as kind of part of that far left, but I'm also trying to be self-critical about like our expectations, what we're aiming for, and whether there's perhaps another another road we could take. Um, <clears throat> So part of the awkwardness of this conversation all the time is that um, it, generates, uh, it, it yeah, generates awkwardness due to a sense of duty to a past 
um, a lineage of struggle and thought, a great high point of socialist politics, which we have inherited and must build upon. Um, what is unfortunate, I think, but also true as far as I can see it, is that this inheritance is really actually based on a real tradition, um, something handed down from one generation to another with a continuity of thought and practice. Instead, we on the far left declare our fidelity to a tradition as though the declaration itself makes it true, um, and as though by laying claim to it through speech, it is in fact ours. Um, the radical socialist tradition in this country, while noteworthy and very interesting for a historian, does not actually have the depth of foundations that we would hope to see to be able to build upon it really today. Um, that, that would legitimise claim to a tradition for any of us living now, like we are part of this lineage of something. I mean, it's, it's just, it doesn't really make sense. Um, <clears throat> essentially, I think, a tradition is something that can be earned over time. It is built and rebuilt by those living in it. It is not claimed by right. Um, so as I continue, please keep in mind uh, that I'm no more arguing that we build a social democratic politics on the high points of its 20th century victories um, to me, this would be the same as claiming some tenuous lineage to the Bolsheviks of 1917. You know, I, I don't think we have the um, continuity to really claim that. Um, but what is useful to learn from, uh, and what can give us guidance today, is not the zenith of either of these political traditions, um, but the efforts that went on to get them to that point. Um, so if there's a tradition worth examining then, it's not the heights of the program or the policy, but instead the tradition of practice within the social democratic movement. And that's kind of what I want to talk about, and I will rush through the rest of the Karen. <laughs> Sorry. So the earliest history of, of social democracy, pre-First pre World War, um, is marked by a significant proliferation of social activity, of integration of the movement itself into the lives of ordinary people, and of self-organisation of civic life based on necessity, so on the needs of the people who are organised and organising. Um, this period, peaking in the late 1800s and in the first decade of the 1900s, was one where the state had little interest in the day-to-day -day lives of working people, um, so long as they showed up for work, of course. Um, NGOs, which uh, organised based on a service model of activity and advocacy, they didn't exist really. Um, and the charity and social life of the church was limited, as well as naturally exclusive, depending on one's faith. Um, alongside this, the commodica commodification of social life, uh, easy access to entertainment and community, or what we should probably call pseudo-community, um, was not complete. Um, enormous aspects of people's social being, from pure leisure to intellectual and educational, artistic, social and sporting pursuits, were not readily accessible for many workers. Um, rather, ordinary people had to organise themselves to meet these needs. The social democratic parties of this period, especially in Germany when the SPD was particularly large, um, set about this sort of organisation alongside their political activities. Um, as such, the social democratic movement was not merely an ecosystem of activist causes uh, and political causes, though explicit political goals were no doubt important. Um, rather, through the self-activity and organisation of its participants, this movement should be read as a decades-long process of class formation. Um, because for us, as socialists, class should not be considered some simple demographic, demographic fact, but an outcome of historical, social and political activity over time. Um, so, let's fast forward to where we are now, and perhaps where we might, where we might expect to go based on some of these ideas. Um, I consider our current environment for a social democratic or socialist, whatever you want to call it, politics to actually be uh, essentially pre-political. Um, so the market provision of everything mediates almost every facet of our lives, unlike the period I was talking about before in the late 1800s. Um, uh, Self-activity and organisation loses an organic and necessary character and instead becomes more of a hobbyist or interest group niche, which is a real risk. Um, there are, however, some aspects of social being, I think, which are largely neglected by both the market and the state still today. 
um, particularly as we see civil society retreating with the with the advent and uh, steady march of neoliberalism, reducing a lot of these um, services and stuff. So firstly, um, regardless of how many Twitter followers one has, or how deep the parasocial relationships you may uh, develop about with a particular podcaster, um, <laughs> the crisis of loneliness in the adult population has been documented in various studies and clickbait headlines, okay? Uh, secondly, while university and higher education is very much organised along market logic, unfortunately, and can effectively be purchased by you as a consumer slash student, um, the actual pursuit of anything that we considered intellectual barely survives contact here with outside, outside the ivory tower. That is certainly my experience and all the experiences of my friends who do have degrees from tertiary education. As soon as you leave, it just all sort of evaporates. No one gives a shit about it anymore. You, don't, you never talk about it again. It's part of why we started the organisation, actually, to, to try and remember what the hell we learnt and spent all that money on. Um, so these two gaps, uh, the social and educational slash intellectual aspects in society, I think are significant. Um, they may not have the immediate political appeal of activist organising, they might not scratch that particular itch of feeling like we're doing something and it's, it's actually changing things in this bigger way. But if people are self-organising for their own needs, something that is not being fulfilled for them by the market or by the state, they're still actually asserting control over their lives, um, which is a hugely important thing. And why I think this framing is important, and I think that what we need to ask as far as immediate self-directed activity goes, um, it should be guided by a principle of necessity. Um, in fact, necessity should dictate our activity rather than activity insisting upon its own uh, necessity. So what we do should match in line with what we feel like we need as people, and if we are doing it in a collective way and organising it ourselves, we are learning the skills, we are learning the abilities to take control over our own lives. And whether that looks exactly like how we think politics should look, it does have this um, useful function to it. So I often talk about the social society um, in this meta kind of conversation way, because people sort of ask me, what is it? Because I sort of help found it, and I'm like, oh, well, I guess I have to be able to answer this question. Um, it's a necessary but insufficient aspect of left politics or socialist politics. We are not doing everything and we are not able to do everything. We are not building a party, we're not doing all these other things that probably do need to happen at some point. The question of high politics or politics of electoralism or politics of like influencing policy, these things are important and we're not doing those things. Nonetheless, what we are doing is, is useful, I think, and it is actually informed by hundreds of years of practice that um, you can learn about, I have a few ideas about books if you're really interested, but um, learn about when thinking about how, how do we get to a situation where there are classes, where there are organisations that represent those classes and represent the political interests of those classes. It takes a huge amount of time, but it also, it's not just a party and running around knocking on doors asking people to elect you for something. That's not really what politics is, and the, the moment you let it become just that, then you're, you're really in quite hot water. You've basically assumed that the world will continue as it is, and the only challenge is to get the most number of votes overall. But you know, if you're actually trying to change things and have a different way of organising society where people are freer and people are more in control of their own destinies, you need to organise society in a lot of other ways, not just to get votes, right? So, I do believe there are gaps um, in New Zealand politics, absolutely, uh, which leave a lot of room for these politics. Um, how we think about this gap, though, it's not just as an untapped voting block that can be whipped into voting a certain way or another, as though this is uh, the entirety of politics. Instead, the gap comes from the bereft nature of contemporary life. Um, that while the market may seem to deliver extraordinary wonders, it also delivers uh, consistent social crises, which most of us experience in one way or another. Um, the more we are collectively taking control over aspects of society, the better place we become to pursue those higher political goals and expand freedom in general. Um, the democratic solution to the social question, also, also called social democracy. Great, thanks a lot Thomas. Um, hopefully that gives um, some of you who are uh, new to our group a bit of an idea of roughly what we're aiming at. 
although we're, sometimes I feel like we're so broad team, uh, I'm not sure we have quite as much coherence as Tom has just articulated. Some of us just want to hang out, you know, and <laughs> chat and make some stuff, have, you know, have some friends offline. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so, right, we're going to take um, a five minute break. Um, and uh, some people need to get away earlier this evening, so um, we're not going to maybe drag out the questions too long tonight. Um, we'll just have a handful. Um, I'll ask the first one just to get things going, and then we can open it to everyone. So let's take a five minute break. So let's come back at, uh, say, 25 past seven. Okay. Uh, which I find hard to do, and I'm probably not going to do now, so I'm not really leading by example, but yeah. Mate, it's got to include a question, not just a statement. <laughs> or it could be a statement plus a little bit of a question, but it's got, there's got to be a question mark there somewhere, okay? Have you ever got a question? I was going to... Well, I can do what I want. I've got my uh, <laughs> chair, but everyone else has to play by the rules, I see. Um, so my question, I suppose this is to uh, the three of you, and um, one of you or several of you can answer it, is really around the historical period that Jim described. Um, there are some similarities, I would say, in, in terms of we're facing now kind of a whole series of crises, um, economic and otherwise, um, as uh, the world faced in the 30s in particular. Um, so there's some sort of similarities at a macro level, but there are also some significant differences. Uh, and uh, one of those differences that comes to mind is the relative weakness of the trade unions um, and also the political parties are not what they were in the 30s, they're not mass-based parties involving you know, many tens or even hundreds of thousands of members who are fairly active. Um, so the question is if we're going to head to a kind of 21st century version of social democracy, and I think if, our, if the left politics in New Zealand are heading anywhere, it is, it is more or less in that direction. Um, can we achieve it without those things? And if we can't, how are we going to uh, build those things which seem to be historically at least a necessary feature of the social democratic project. So, um, yeah. It's a good question. It is a big question. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to ban all the other questions. We'll just talk about this one. <laughs> um, you guys can answer it. <laughs> You're the practicing politician. <laughs> okay, so what was the question? Oh, sorry. So, so in the past, unions. yeah, in the past we had you know the, the very strong union, trade unions, quite militant, and big mass-based political parties, and I would argue they were quite critical to to getting the kind of foundations of the welfare state laid. But we arguably don't really have that today. So if we're going to head in that direction, can we do it without that? Or if we can't, how are we going to build that? Yeah. <laughs> I'll have a go. Um, not definitive. Um, actually, in 1935, the trade unions in this country were pretty weak, the reason being mass unemployment. Um, there were some, and they were important, but that likewise now. There are some, and they are important. I think a key part of it is the conversations within... Um, it's a weak term. Um, I can't think of a better one. Civil society, you know, in all the organisations, all the contexts that we're part of. And I think the fundamental message, and this is perhaps something I didn't say enough about, is that it is a moral business. It is about human values. And I'm, you know, Tom um, really made that point, and, and I'm grateful to him for it. This is not simply about... Um, you know, more for me, more for you, what's in it for me, what's in it for you. It is that we are all in it together. And that, I think, is what Walter Nash and his colleagues, and I go back to Nash because he was the ethicist. Um, he was an ethical socialist. Um, it is a moral question. We are all in it together. We do depend on each other. And somehow, if we can shift that conversation, uh, as well as identifying the things that need to be done, and what we as citizens have a right to expect of um, organisations of state and economy, that's where we might usefully start. Happy to jump in briefly. Um, I, I largely agree with Jim. I think um, whether it's powerful trade unions, whether it's large mass-based parties, Certainly what we need is a more uh, a level of conscious 
intention towards a certain outcome of a way that we want society to be. And that can be mediated through what Jim referred to as civil society, it can be mediated through something even um, lower level, even more human scale of like um, the conversations we may have with one another, within our families, within our friend groups and so on. But uh, certainly when I was younger I found this sort of thing very hard to talk about because it seemed like moralising or something. But now that I'm 33, so I'm getting very elderly. Um, <laughs> um, Come on. I do. I, I, I think the argument that, like, what is. Well, that's you. <laughs> um, I think the argument about what, like, needs to change is more of a moral question, and it's almost like a. a a revolution in the way we think about what, what actually we want our lives to be like. And I don't think it's that far away for a lot of people because I think modern, like capitalist modernity, the way that we live right now, most people, they take it or leave it, you know. We're ambivalent about it. It gives us enormous, you know, extraordinary variation and no satisfaction. It gives us the ability to consume stuff that we don't even want in the first place. So it gives us all of these things, you know, so we're terribly comfortable, yet nonetheless unsatisfied. And I think <coughs> the conversation about, like, what would be a better way to organise society is right on the cusp of a lot of people's thinking. It just depends how you approach them. And probably you can't approach them being like, hello, I am from the left, and would you like to also be on the left with me? <laughs> you know, that's probably not going to work. Um, but you know, there, there are conversations, and there's a long process of just, like, talking to people about, like, what would be a better way to live, that, that definitely needs to happen and um, is slowly happening, I think. Um, hopefully it can accelerate. <laughs> so, I think just the... Uh, okay, so I um, really didn't really want to join a political party and I grew up pretty suspicious of them um, as a kid because I just, you know, well, we all know, I don't tell you why. We feel suspicious of political parties. But, um, and so, like I was saying in my court at all before, I mean, I felt a bit reluctant about joining the Greens, but I guess for me it was like, that's a, um, that's a, a kind of vehicle by which I can achieve what I want to achieve. But what's been really informed, like, really interesting about the campaign that I am currently running and the campaign I ran last year was that, um, a lot of people who were involved weren't green members or green volunteers. Um, they were looking for that opportunity to be involved in something and to be able to um, have a kind of um, tangible outcome to to um, that political involvement that was a lot more, I guess, certain than some of the other things that we campaign for and stuff like that. But I guess one thing I wanted to say was um, it makes life a bit easier and definitely harder being Māori because at the end of the day like I don't need to rely on a union or a party because I've got my iwi and my hapu you know and we're bound to each other by whakapapa and so you know I feel like we what I really don't like about political parties is we're just so harsh on each other and that's like members too you know like if you don't know what you're talking about, if you don't have evidence underpinning what you're saying and if you don't have the research to back it up well you know nothing sometimes in these spaces you know and I'm sure there's a similar hierarchy within unions too. And there's definitely hierarchies within iwi and hapu too, but I feel like it gives an alternative vehicle that I can really look forward to. So like my hopes and aspirations in my life is that my I'm gonna go home to my whenua with my hapu, we're gonna build houses and be able to provide that for ourselves. We're gonna have our own education, you know, we've got our own education system, we've got the Kura Kaupapa movement, Te Ahu Matua, We've got our own ways of how to building our housing and living communally. We have managed to retain some of the ways that we understand how to grow kai and um, provide that um, for um, ourselves. And um, and so, like I feel really safe knowing that I can go back to that that group. But at the same time, when we were talking about this yesterday at our Uber Māori Wānanga, hapu. Uh, you know, you might know that as a sub-tribe, that's the literal um, translation, but what it really is, is it's just a collective of people who happen to be in the same place, who just um, see the value in organising things together and pooling resources to be able to provide everything that we need. That's all hapua. 
lots of hapu um, are new hapu, like for example, so I'm from Ngāti Awa, which is in Whakatane, but we've got a hapu called Ngāti Awa Ki Pōneke, which is all the people from Ngāti Awa living in Wellington. And I think that that like maybe that provides a bit of help of what you know a bit of a structure for how we could organize ourselves um you know because all it is is that we're not even all related it, like it's just that we kind of all have a similar similar aspirations similar dreams we feel a sense of obligation towards each other and we know that we can't really rely on the state to have well we definitely can't rely on the state to have our back um, and that we might not get our needs met if we don't find that for ourselves. And I guess it's that acknowledgement that we all have our own skills and things to offer. And if we pull those, we kind of have everything that we need. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about stuff that's happening in the iwi and hapu space. Um, and my hope would be that um, other groups can also find that for them, what that looks like for themselves too, because um, that gives a lot of like, um, yes, a bit more certainty and feelings of security. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's um, yeah, really interesting range of answers um, to an intentionally tricky question, um, thought-provoking question. Um, of course, I don't have the answers either, so I'm genuinely curious. Um, okay, so let's um, open floor to anyone who has any questions. How have we done this in the past? Have we... Hayden's not here, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Angus, <laughs> Angus, you're... Just... Yeah, yeah. Well, you have some of the experience, right? Well. Yeah, but do we hand the mic around? No, no, they'll, they'll, they'll just stand up. Okay, okay, all right, all right. You just have to speak loudly to make sure you project. Um, James Shaw said, uh, I think in an interview with Toby Manhire, that in order for us to achieve our goals in terms of environmentalism, it's necessary for us to have a more egalitarian society that's more in line with you know, socialist ideals. After announcing the Greens policy when it comes to tax, um, I'm just interested to hear what the panelists think about I guess the future intersection of socialism and environmentalism and climate change and just that going on. Um well, yeah, I mean, it kind of just makes sense to me um, that the things that are good for people and that make life um, easier and more affordable for people and more enjoyable for people are things that also benefit the environment. So, like, um, so, for example, building housing in, the, in a city is good because, you know, we need workers to be able to live here. We need whatever we want. We want people living in the city that represents society, you know, you want everyone to be able to live here, but at the same time it has massive benefits for um, reducing emissions because it means people can jump on a bus and, or walk to where they need to go. So, like, everything that's good that I think socialists tend to advocate for have really good social and environmental co-benefits. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, I, Yes, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's kind of it, but yeah. Yeah. I'll have a little I think something Tam mentioned before about obligation comes in here, and I think um, uh, any socialist movement should understand itself to have an obligation towards the planet as well, because as we see, we all live here, um, and that obligation is. Uh, far-reaching, complex, and something that we often um, don't fully understand, but we, we should nonetheless do our best to, um, you know, in integrate these two politics together as far as makes sense, right? Um, I think, for me, the environmental question is both very important and also, like, sometimes really um, mystified in this country because we have a real risk, I think, of moving towards a pseudo-environmental society by um, effectively offshoring anything that would ever be uh, grubby 
to produce that would ever be unpleasant towards the environment and we could turn ourselves into just a pure tourist society um, in which we feel very, very good about how green we are and we can all just live on, um, you know, writing emails to each other or something, you know. Like, the, the, the question about the environment has to, be the, has to be a question about the economy as well. Like, there is no such thing as a real economy that doesn't interact with the world. You know, you cannot eat emails. We cannot, you know, this is not, we can't just turn tourism into food. Like this, there are, there are questions around like the human population. We, need, we have certain things that we need and we need to interact with the planet in order to do that. And I think there's a huge question to say like, how do we responsibly and seriously uh, understand our obligation to the planet and also understand that we have an obligation to like, figure it out, like for ourselves. We can't simply, offshore everything we need to another country which we have no democratic say over how they decide to organise labour, how they decide to use natural resources, they'll make it all for us and we'll ship it here and we'll not think about it. And as far as we're concerned, that's a that's a, a carbon neutral situation because it's not our problem, it's their problem, you know? So I think there's a big question to be said, and Jim mentioned this term very early in his talk, about economic nationalism around understanding what do we need? What are we making? Are we taking the best possible route to create that stuff, to, to, to produce that stuff in a way that's responsible towards the environment, but doesn't simply shirk our duties and pass it off onto often, you know, developing countries or something like that. So that's a, that's a lot of the question I think that's often lacking when we talk about environmentalism and New Zealand politics. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add a couple of things. Um, when I was taken through um, some of the Marxist classics a uh, long time ago now, uh, one thing that stuck in my mind is the principle that capitalism is about limitless consumption. I mean, it's basically inherent in capitalist systems that they can't stop growing, they can't not. And when they, if they are interrupted, that's a crisis. Um, so, on one level, it's as simple as that. Therefore, the ecological crisis, because the planet is finite, resources are finite. Um, so, yeah, we have to think about ways of, if you want to call it degrowth, that's, that's fine. Um, we have to think about ways of doing that equitably, of doing that so that, again, um, all human needs are met. And these points about excessive mindless consumption are valid. Um, yeah, we certainly have an obligation to the earth, but we also have an obligation to future generations. And I think again, you know, um, I, I'm surprised, but I, I keep coming back to talking about moral and ethical things. In the end, um, yeah, the analysis is important, but in the end, it's about it's about values, it's about um, human values, it's about ecological values. It's a hell of a task. Um, the scope of the vested interests, um, either that nothing will happen, or not very much has to happen, or uh, we could put it off past 2030, or somebody, yeah, we could offshore it all, or, well, yes, it is a problem as long as it doesn't affect me. All that, I mean, it's, it's such a huge thing to have to argue against. But again, I think the conversation is just need, we just need to keep carrying it on. And I'm not sure that's a very satisfactory answer, but, but I think in the end, uh, fundamentally, the economic system we have and the ecological crisis are like that. I um, just thought I'd add that uh, James Remwick uh, put an article on stuff only a few days ago where he seems to be taking a much more explicitly political turn. This is uh, uh, probably seen in the press. He's a famous New Zealand climatologist and he's calling for a degrowth economy, essentially. Um, so that's what the scientists are saying as well as the political bottoms. Great, okay, um, great answers. So let's take, we can probably do maybe one or two, or maybe two more questions, depending on. Um, uh, Dan, you, did you have your hand up earlier? <laughs> oh, okay, right. um, I, do, I do have a question for Samantha because you were talking about uh, the 
um, how you were dealing with the developers for the Arlington Street um, uh, social housing um, complex. I was just wondering, like, how how grim it was dealing with those guys. Like, like how much push and pull is there uh, to try and you know you know turn a profit for the sake of you know uh, basic human right? Like, because it, it, it just seems so. It seems so contrary to me that we have to deal with the developer to then build housing for people. I don't know. It, it, yeah, just feel free to have a vent. Uh, you know, this is a question to, yeah. to just have a vent. <laughs> so with with the Arlington stuff that's going on and, and all the um, public housing that we went to um, visit last week, all the um, development sites, we were just talking about climate order, so we weren't actually talking to the um, to the developers on that, and um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't know in terms of um, the public housing aspect, but it has been busy working with um, developers on the affordable housing side of things. So basically, council has this program called Tikaina. Um It's about, um, it's about there's a target of building a thousand affordable houses for people to rent in Wellington and it's trying to make use of old office buildings and converting them into apartments so you might know people that live there there's like 200 we've done 200 in the last couple of years and um, they're like along Willis Street you might have seen them or know people that live in there and um, and we tried to make them for um, I don't know like workers that we you know identified weren't able to live in the city, which kind of was just anybody, of course, but we tried to target it a bit, and um, yeah, it was kind of buzzy working with them on that. I guess it's really, it was really hard to kind of um, identify what their kind of um, goals were from working um, on those projects, because for me, like, my goal was that if we can build enough affordable housing, it's going to bring down the kind of... Um, average rents within the city but then I'm not sure why that um, might have appealed to them when they're trying to sell investment um, properties but um, but it, I mean it, it works for now um, but it but it is buzzy and I think that something that we should all be careful of is this idea of affordable housing right because what's happening in Auckland and it's happening actually everywhere it's happening in a lot of places is um, kind of order uh, taking state housing selling it, uh, sorry, sorry, demolishing it, especially like low density state housing, and a really good example of this is in GI, in Glen Innes in Auckland, and they're taking the state housing, demolishing it, intensifying it, and then they'll sell off like, they'll say like 30% of this will be public housing, and then they'll champion it as like this has got to be a net increase of like 100 public houses or whatever. Then they're saying 30% has got to be affordable housing, and then the other 40% has got to be sold to, for people to buy as like cheap Kiwi build, you know, affordable homes to buy. And that to me is a privatisation of public assets because you're taking land that could be 100% public housing when you've got thousands of people currently waiting for a public home and you're allowing people to buy it and then it's gone, you know, gone for good once it passes into private ownership. So it's really insidious and I'm not sure like this Labour government and particularly um, Minister Megan Woods have this like real obsession with building affordable housing as opposed to um, public housing and I think that's a really da like dangerous thing that we do have to keep our eyes on. Um, we, when we um, were setting up our community housing provider um, there was someone tried to slip in like a 10% target of affordable housing with everything that this new community housing provider will build and I got that taken out and everyone was like, what, what, do you hate affordable housing? Like, do you hate people that need affordable housing? And I was like, no, but that 10% is taking away from public housing. And as far as I'm concerned, that's where the biggest need is. And in order for us to move away from it being like only for the most needy and making it for everybody that wants it, we have to just build a whole lot of it. So, um, but yeah, watch that affordable housing thing because it's really insidious and I get the sense that there's like this desire to move towards building only affordable housing and catering to that you know real kind of like upper lower class kind of middle class group who you know can't quite afford a house yet but are like have to make <coughs> decent salaries compared to people um, in public housing and 
there's just got to be a total neglect of people that rely on public housing. So I think that's something that we've got to watch out for. Yeah. Sorry, that was not the right that I wanted to Tony. Yes, can I just make an observation? I don't have a question. Um, no no statements. Statement. No. <laughs> I'll come to the question in the end. The problem that social democracy has is every time somebody appears on television to tell us that the end is nigh, half the viewing audience gets up and leaves the room to have this. <laughs> they don't want to hear that. The enemy of social democracy is consumer capitalism. And consumer capitalism is evil. But hell, isn't it fun? <laughs> <laughs> until we can find our way through that conundrum, uh, we aren't going to solve the problem. And my question is, how are we going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose it's kind of a version of a question I asked, maybe. Do we want to touch on that again? <laughs> Very quickly, I think, um, yeah, you are right, it is fun. Um, I guess all we can hope for is that uh, a more um, egalitarian, but also more connected and I think ultimately more human way of living with one another is also fun. You know, we think we do have to basically compete on the question of what are human needs and is it merely like the sugar hit of consumer capitalism or there, is there another way of living that people will find actually more valuable? I don't know, but that, that's basically where you have to place your money, you know. Yeah, it's, it's the conversation. Um, and again, you know, this goes back to um, the Values Party in 1972, the world's first Green Party. Yeah, the crisis they said then is not a crisis of, um, of material goods, it's a crisis of the human spirit. Um, yeah, like, like you said, Thomas, it's uh, competing on that. What, are, yeah, what do people really value? Um, and maybe, you know, all sorts of things, but it's a, it's a really important conversation. Yeah, when you press people, um, is it this, that, this latest thing or that latest thing? I think for most people, not. It's just the enormous power, as you said, of consumer capitalism. Um, it's temporarily fun, but leaves a hangover. I can very quickly jump on the end of that and themed on the hangover question. Um, let's take an example. I like a beer, but I like a beer here with you guys. A beer at home by myself doesn't mean anything to me. So what is it about consumption that we actually enjoy? It's not necessarily the consumption itself. So there's actually a huge amount of room, I think, for, for changing the way that we live based on actually what people value. <coughs> All right, well, um, I think we maybe could do one f uh, final question. Do you know um, what this is a question for Tam. So a lot of these chats are super fun, but it seems to be sort of middle class sort of navel gazing all the time. <laughs> so how can we achieve sort of structural change? And does changing MP well and central mean much at the end of the day? And Tam, why do you think it does? And if so, why should people get involved? <laughs> okay. Stop. Okay. All right. So the first part of that question was. Sorry. Uh, uh, so the first part was. Can you say that again? Oh, I've forgotten. Oh, okay. Which okay. I love doing. Yeah. So this <laughs> well, um. <laughs> I don't know about that one. That, oh, that's a you problem. <laughs> I'll leave that for you guys to sort out. But, um, but um, in terms of like the, um, in terms of like what difference does it make in terms of the ele the electric MP or the local the MP? Because there's so many radical anarchists and radical far left socialists who think electoral politics is a complete waste of time. Yeah, and, and in some ways I do too. I think it's a total waste of time. Like I told, told you guys, my um, I really should do that. <laughs> but like my like my my dream is like, oh, why would I want to live here when I could go live on the beach in Fakatani and with white people and like do cool stuff like and, and stuff like that. So like, 
I totally can see like why people feel that way, like what's, why bother, but I think it's pretty clear, and I hate to bring her up, but Chloe Swilbrick has been a really good, really good example of things that you can achieve by being like a real vocal and really good MP. And I think for me, it's about like that, what that platform can provide is um, just sh changing the conversation, like totally shifting that conversation. And as a councillor who puts these things into action, in terms of um, housing, in terms of transport, in terms of all sorts of things that impact people's lives, you have to kind of shift that conversation to make things possible. And so I think as an MP, you get a whole set of opportunities. You get the opportunity every single day to, to set that conversation about where things can be going and where things should be. And it's like, it is kind of about shifting that Overton window about what's politically possible. It's like, I think, that, and I was talking to, I can't remember who I was talking to about this, but there's like soft power and hard power when it comes to the parties, and I think people make their decision based on what they want and what they think is their like theory of change, but I think if you join the Labour Party or the National Party, you kind of, you, you're heading to, you're in that kind of hard power direction where you can actually change the law, and well, I know that's not, I know there's like MMP and stuff, but basically, you know, you will basically be able to change the law and actually change the system. Whereas if you opt for like a small party like the Greens, I feel like you're taking that soft power route, but that is still important in terms of changing those conversations. Like I think Chloe has started an entire conversation about, you know, all sorts of things, but namely drug law reform and taxing the mega wealthy. And she's been a real pivotal voice in that and, and might be able to change those systems through those conversations that she's had. Is it fast enough? Is it good enough? Uh, probably not, but um, but I think those are the tools that we have available to us at the moment, and and it depends on the on the person too because like the way that I like to do my politics is I like to organise. So when I was beefing with M Minister Woods about not giving us income related rent subsidy, my response to that was going to, into our council housing, making connections with people who actually were directly affected, and trying to kind of uplift their stories and, and pl platform their stories through, through the media so that people would understand what that reality actually looks like. And it's the same with um, when we got money for um, for this Courtney, you know, making town safer in terms of um, uh, trying to combat sexual violence essentially in town. That was a movement that came through supporting particularly young women and gender minorities to be able to speak to their reality and their truth. And so I see what my role would be, would be that active facilitation of people being able to share those realities and hope that that conversation sets the ground by which we can actually implement the things that we want to see in our city. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I think um, we've been very fortunate to have the, our three panellists this evening um, and um, hopefully we haven't uh, gone on too long. Um, so, yeah, uh, can we have another round of applause for everyone here? <laughs> since um, Chloe came up in that uh, last comment, uh, that we do actually have an event coming up. Angus, can you remind me when that is? Thursday next week. Thursday next week. 22nd. Uh, 22nd. Um, uh, which, uh, it's going to be here. Is that right? Yep, we're always here. Um, so Chloe's going to uh, have a sort of a chat with us, basically. Um, so um, that's going to be an interesting evening, I think. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be here, but um, you guys will be able to enjoy it. Um, so yeah, um, thanks again to everyone um, for coming along tonight, and I hope you got something out of it. Um, uh, this is sort of our first post Hayden uh, <laughs> event, the, the previous chair, uh, predecessor to, to uh, Angus has um, moved to Britain for a couple of years. So, um, so a few of us are uh, uh, sort of trying to step up and, and, and help a bit more with some of the organisation to support uh, Angus. So. Um, 
Yeah, so thanks again. And there's a, a sign up sheet, just to remind everyone again, which, okay, now it's down here. Sorry, it's shifting. Um, yeah, so if you are interested in joining the society, um, please um, put your details down there. But otherwise, you can find us online. Um, so, yeah, cheers, enjoy. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening.